our Jewish community has faced tremendous challenges, mentally, physically, emotionally, and financially. But we've been tested before, and we know that by working together, we can keep our community safe and healthy today, tomorrow, and all the tomorrows yet to come. The key to our community's enduring strength is its generous support of the Jewish Federation of Cleveland's annual campaign year after year. Thanks to the dedication and compassion of Jewish Clevelanders, Federation is the security net our community needs in uncertain times like today. And like any year, the driving force that helps keep Cleveland one of the most vibrant and caring Jewish communities in the world. Because of you and your continued support, Federation is here for good. And together, we will always be here for good. The goal tonight is even though we're not in person, this is still the place to be. So I invite you for the next 75 minutes to sit back and enjoy, to pause or at least try to pause all the stress in your life and truly escape, to connect and engage in a meaningful way. Because tonight we have a special opportunity to hear from incredible women, to share their stories, share your own story, make a difference and show how this community that Together, we can change the world. Together, we women in philanthropy are here for good. A big thank you to our sponsor, Banish, for helping make tonight possible and our incredible vice chair team for planning tonight's program, as well as our women in philanthropy professionals. We're so grateful for our Federation leaders. Please help join me in recognizing our general campaign chair, Bradley Sherman, our board chair, David Heller, and our federation president, Erica Rudin-Luria, who you'll be hearing from shortly. The strength of women in philanthropy is built upon our past leaders and continues to grow under current leadership. In your program, you will find a list of past chairs of women in philanthropy and the 2020 leadership team. Our programming is made possible by their insight, enthusiasm, and energy of all these women. We also want to thank all of you, donors to the 2021 Annual Campaign for Jewish Needs. Although this year's annual campaign may look and feel a little different, we are all still working towards one very important goal, to make life in our Jewish community better today and even stronger for the future. And now, in this time, we need you more than ever. To date, we have raised close to $23.7 million pledge. Yes, 23 million. But last year we raised 33 million. So we have a long ways to go and we need your help. For those of you who have not made your pledge yet this year, as the Pointer Sisters like to say, tonight's the night we're gonna make it happen. All of you received a letter in your gift box or an email sharing what you so generously pledged last year. Our goal is to close all open pledges tonight, as well as welcome any new pledges from new donors. And for those of you that have already made your pledge for 2021, thank you. And if you should feel so generous, we would love for you to give a little extra more. And we're making it super easy for you to pledge right now. You can text to give with the number that's gonna pop up in the chat, it's also in your letter. You can visit the website that's also gonna pop up in your chat and in your email or the letter, you got a QR code also. Your gift will also do twice as much good this year because with the Mandel match, every new or increased gift to the 2021 campaign, the Mandel Foundation will match that donation to Federation's coronavirus emergency relief fund in the amount of that new gift or that increase from last year. There are over 300 women who signed up for this Zoom tonight. What if all 300 women said, I'm in and made a pledge? On Friday, this Friday, two days from now before Shabbat, we are going to send out an email to all of you, all attendees sharing the results of what the 300 women on this call decided to do tonight. So let's stand tall and be generous together. Let's all be counted. 
Let's show our collective strength and let's make a difference together. To kick off tonight's event, we have the honor of celebrating the amazing Marielle Luango as this year's recipient of the Irene Zeman Volunteer Award. It's now my honor to turn the Zoom over to my good friend and fellow rock star woman in philanthropy, Hallie Ram Kogelschatz, to introduce this award. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so before we jump into the main part of the main event, I'd like to take a moment to talk about a very special woman, Irene Zeman of Blessed Memory. The Irene Zeman Volunteer Award established in 1980 recognizes a woman group of women or women's organization who demonstrate the highest ideals and practices of volunteer service. Today is about recognizing a champion among us. <laughs> excuse me. She is combating food insecurity during the COVID-19 pandemic, all while being a driver in the future of a strong, caring, and vibrant Jewish community on Cleveland's west side. I am so pleased to share the story of my incredible friend, Marielle Luango, this year's recipient of the 2020 Irene Zeman Volunteer Award. This kind of work inside the Jewish community have been done for me and for my family for generations. Um, it's just exactly what we do. This community was not going to let each other go hungry. So the Westside Food Co-op is an initiative that started actually around PESA time, right at the beginning of the pandemic. We were distributing these beautiful PESA boxes that we have done for a couple of years now, thanks to JFSA. And that was like the beginning of the rumors where we start hearing the pulse of the community that food insecurity was going to be a massive issue to deal during this pandemic. With COVID, she recognized how many Jews were having issues and didn't have food, specifically on the West Side. And she mobilized. She did whatever she could to get the right food in the right place at the right time to the right people. The food co-op is literally who she is. The food co-op is just a representation of how she envisions a community should be. It's starting in the garage because this is where the buckets were in the beginning. We go out of our way to make sure everybody's need is fulfill without being invasive in what the privacy of the family is. And we try to integrate a lot of other agencies and services into the food co-op. This is a really, really special, exceptional person. And I couldn't be more thrilled for her that she is being honored with the Irene Zeman Award. During the war, Grandma Irene saw the need to send salamis to Jewish soldiers who were fighting abroad. And she literally set up a little industry in her basement where the community came together to wrap salamis in wax so that they could be sent. When she passed away, her two daughters, my Aunt Judy and my mother, established this award to help carry on her legacy of improving the world one act of kindness at a time. It was just so clear that Mary Ellie passed the salami test. I mean, her entire actions during this pandemic has it's been nothing more than total salami. I think it's a very Jewish thing that if you have it, even if you just have one, you split it in half and share it. If you're not off, you teach off. Like, whatever you have, it don't have to be grandioso, it don't have to be majestic, you don't have to have all the answers. When we start this, we have no idea where this was going to take. We have no idea who was going to be a supporter or not. It's a lot of trust that our community will show up because they do over and over. The co-op is definitely a basis for community building, for people to feel like there's a hub to share resources. And I think that definitely throughout the pandemic, it's an important need. And even after the pandemic is over, it can evolve into a place where there's resources available, where all the greater Cleveland resources can be available to all the West Side families. It's extraordinarily humbling to walk into this award knowing the legacy and knowing who have received it before me. And it's really inspiring to see what come out of it and how much other people care for what you're doing. Marielle's Jewish values are at the core of what Federation does, what Federation is here for, and what our community needs. Marielle is here for good. There's a concept called Lamed Vavnik, that there are 36 
Jewish saints living among us, doing good in the world, without whom the world would crumble. Mary Ellie is so much beyond a volunteer extraordinaire. Mary Ellie is one of these Lama books. Mazel tov, Mary Ellie, and thank you for all your good work. It's especially needed at these difficult times. Thank you. Mazel tov, Mary Ellie. Thank you. Mazel tov, Mary Ellie, and an award very well deserved. Thank you for everything that you do for the West Side, for all of Cleveland, for all Jews around the world. You're amazing. Your spirit, your sense of community, and your dynamic vitality is just infectious. We're so happy for you on a personal level, on a community level. We know that this is gonna be a stepping stone for so many great things. Mazel tov, Mary Ellie! Congratulations! So well deserved. Mazel tov, Bunny, for your big old word. So happy for you. Masia, what do you say to Bunny? Thank you. Um, thank you. I want to thank the Jewish Federation and the Zimmerman family for this award. This video, I, I will carry it with me for a very long time. Um, truthfully, you're carving something in my heart that I could not imagine was possible. When I have the privilege to talk with the Zimmerman family, one of the things that they give me permission, besides calling this the Pastrami Wax Award, was to brag about my family and my community um, because this truthfully was a community effort. And I know the word community can be used very trendy and a fulfiller of a sentence, but I promise you this truthfully, not surprising, was a woman's effort where we knew that babies were going to get hungry and that we were not going to allow that. In fact, we were not even going to allow the mothers to worry about the babies getting hungry. This was Deborah knowing the families and the routes and how to get to them. This was my friend Asia having the expertise in her resume about how to do this efficiently and preserving the dignity of everybody who do it. But this especially was the legacy of what we call Bobby Sheila, who have been doing also this from her garage for five decades in the rain. And just like that, I can start mentioning this snowball of names of once again women who do not need explication, who just pick up the phone and did it. When early on the day, early in the event, we were feeling that survey about what we worry, I laugh because I know that's the most Jewish thing ever. We all go to bed with this list of neurotic thoughts about everything that is going wrong, especially these times. But when I go to bed, I also know that I'm going with the security of having each other. That I know that the fact that you're here in once again, another Zoom call, that we're going to put our pocket boots together, that we're going to put our brains together, that somehow or another we have been doing this for over a hundred years, made me go to sleep a little better. And very soon we're going to hear from this magnificent woman resolving these very big problems. But I promise you the fact that you're here tonight make me resolve our biggest problems. And I thank you from the deepest of my heart. Um, what an honor. One day this will feel real and I will probably put this in my wall to remind myself of this moment. Thank you, have a good night. Mazel tov, Mary Elaine. You're amazing. You brought us to tears. Mazel tov, Mary Ellie. Um, as Mary Ellie shared, as a recipient of the Irene Zeman Award, Mary Ellie was presented with a beautiful frame certificate. And also a gift was made to the Cleveland Chesed Center, which was at her request. Uh, you truly are a definition of a woman in philanthropy, stepping up and doing good, no matter how big or small, and you make such a difference to so many. Mazel. Our featured speaker, is not only a dear friend, 
but a true leader in the business and philanthropic community. Tonight, we have the honor of welcoming Marcella Kamfarolnik, Executive Chair of Gojo, maker of Purell Brand Solutions, and fellow woman in philanthropy to share her story. Marcella's full bio is available in your event program. And as many of you will agree, which was the highlight of the gift box, uh, Purell has become a household name during this pandemic. I actually think it's a verb, like have you Purelled? Purell before dinner, please, right? Um, <laughs> we're so thankful for Marcella and her family's dedication to health and community before, during, and what we know will be after this pandemic. Tonight, Marcella will share with all of you why she is here for good, both in business and in her personal life. We will then have the opportunity to go into some breakout rooms where you can reflect on Marcella's words and share why you are here for good too. To lead this conversation with Marcella this evening, we are excited to have Erica Ruda Moria, our Federation President, who just so happens to also be a good friend of Marcella's. And both of these phenomenal women have truly been on the front lines and saving lives during this very challenging time and putting their strong Jewish values first. Erica, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Michelle. And just mazel tov, Mary Ellie. And I think you so eloquently pointed out how so many people who are on the call with us and who aren't have really been serving, um, serving people in the community. So Marcella, it is such a pleasure to have you on Zoom. I wish it were in person, um, but I think that um, I, we're gonna have a really interesting conversation and I'm so excited for the Cleveland Jewish community, for those that don't know you, to get to know you a little bit. Um, so you're a business leader, you have an active family and you're a philanthropist. Um, let's start at the beginning in Akron. Are there any moments you can point to growing up in Akron that shaped your idea of what a community is and what it means to be part of a community? Uh, well, thank you. Before I get started, I just have to acknowledge you, Mary Ellie. You are such an inspiration. I, I just feel so uplifted. I think you're the woman of the hour. I'm just the cleanup crew afterwards, pun intended. Um, <laughs> So I also want to thank you, Michelle. It's really great to be with you. I'm very humbled by your ask for me to, to join your community for the evening. And Erica, it's, it's a ton of fun. I just have to tell you, a couple of years ago, I found out from someone who works at a Jewish camp, the verb is not just in English. The heat parel apparently is a new verb in Hebrew. So you can use it all. Um, and, and I, I hope that. Purell and won't need the key as much. I always say Purell is to liberate, not make you neurotic, but to liberate you to feel free to engage in the world, which I know is especially scary right now. Um, okay, so let's get into your first question. You know, the thing about Jewish Akron is it's a very intimate community, and I credit my parents and my grandparents from both sides of my family for really embracing community in all the different ways, right? They didn't just pick one institution or one way of engaging. They sent me and my siblings to Jewish day school. We went to Jewish summer camp. We joined youth group. We had a chavara with some of my parents' best friends and their kids were my peers. And so in the synagogues, we had three synagogues then as we do now, and we belong to all three of them. And, um, and, and so I would just say, you know, I was raised with a sense that community really wasn't about dividing up and parceling out, but really about joining together and finding strength in, in our small but mighty selves. Um, so for me, the one lesson was about multi-modality or, or finding um, beauty in everyone being together. The second thing that again, I give my parents and grandparents so much credit, they were both about vision and making new big things happen, not being afraid of a challenging scenario that was really exciting. And at the same time, rolling up their sleeves and putting the effort in. So they founded the Jewish day school and they grew it. Um, they worked in it. Uh, they led virtually every single board in uh, in the community. So it was really about having big vision and then going after it, right? And I think the the last thing, uh, and there are many, but the last thing I'll talk about right now is that my my parents really taught me that you should really spend your time where you want to be with people who are like minded and like valued. So you know, find your people. So when you're thinking about how to plug into the community. You know, find the people that you want to roll up your sleeves with, that you want to dream, dream big with. 
Um, so that really um, is, I think, a testament to my, my growing up in Akron. No, thank you. And one of the um, things that we've tried so hard to do throughout even this weird pandemic time is to find ways to join together and find ways to help people find their people. So I want to shift because I know people are very curious. I think many of us remember when it was the beginning of the pandemic. For us in Jewish Cleveland, it was March 9th, uh, Passover, uh, Megillah reading was going to start in a few hours, and we got a call. And I remember one of our first moves was to call the Cuyahoga County Board of Health, who I had to explain Purim to, which was quite funny, actually. <laughs> um, so what was the beginning for you and for Gojo? And how, you know, personally, professionally, when was the moment that that you knew this was different? So this is not our first outbreak. We as a company have lived through many, never as big and as sort of existential as this one, but there was SARS and the avian flu and H1N1 and Ebola and really bad seasonal flus as early as, as recently as 2018. And so we had developed years ago a detect and alert process where we have people scanning the media and epidemiological information from around the world. And sometimes it turns into nothing and sometimes it turns into a global pandemic on the scale that we're experiencing today. So I was looking back at the emails because I, I knew you were gonna ask me this question. When did we first start talking about this? And there is a mid January email from a scientist of ours. And um, he literally uh, mentioned that um, pathogenic viruses that aren't quite at, at first glance aren't quite as bad and as deadly tend to spread more quickly and widely because it's much harder to trace them symptoms are a little bit less acute and he said it looks like this is going to be very widespread and early global precautions are well warranted so that was in january um, our business team quickly got together and turned on our production capacity we ramped up from five days a week two shifts a day to seven days a week, uh, 24 hours a day. So we rapidly ramped up. Now it took the world a little bit of time to catch up with us, but by March, we were already having to go in allocation, which means that all of our partners that bring the product to the retailers and to the businesses um, started creating um, literally almost infinite demand, uh, which is why most of you for many months couldn't find our products on the shelves because we were fulfilling the most um, frontline uh, needs out there that the essential workers, the frontline healthcare workers and so forth. So that started happening around March and uh, things are still extremely intense uh, at work, which maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, in terms of personal, I have to tell you, um, even though on the business side, we were responding, uh, my second son's bar mitzvah was supposed to have been March 14th. And uh, as the weeks went on, I just kept saying to my husband, we just have to hang on because we just have to get there. He has worked so hard and he is so ready for this. And um, it wasn't until March, I think 11th or 12th that we actually made the final call. Um, and, and my son, I give him a ton of credit. He came to me knowing that his great grandmothers or not just his grandmothers were going to wanna be there for him. And he said, I just can't make anyone get sick. So at that point, Josh and I knew that we weren't going to have the bar mitzvah as planned. Um, so it really was sort of an emotional process um, separate from the business process. You know, it's, I think um, someone had said to me a few months ago that this time is marked by so many um, small and large losses for people and that they're just, they, they're just kind of piling, um, they're piling up. So you and Josh, say to your kids, we're moving back to Akron temporarily. Um, I know that throughout this, many of us have had to explain to family members why they need to be careful, why they shouldn't leave their house, why they should be wearing a mask. How did you, um, how did you share this with your kids? Um, what did you say to them? Well, obviously we weren't the only ones sharing information. They're living in a world where media is everywhere and the schools were starting to shut down. So they were getting a lot of bombardment. And I had been sharing with them the way that my dad did with us kids when we were growing up around the dinner table, what was happening at work. 
Um, they were seeing the extra phone calls and the, and the late night emailing. So I think it was less about what do I, how do I explain it and more how to approach coping with it. And at our company at Gojo, we talk a lot about being competency-based. How do we develop the competencies? The job will always change, right? So don't just good at, get good at one thing, develop a competency that can carry you through change. So one of those competencies is living with ambiguity and dealing with that ambiguity. Now more than ever in virtually every facet of our lives, um, we are having to deal with not knowing certain what's going to happen. It's extremely hard for adults to develop that competency if they don't come by it naturally, and also for kids who really thrive on certainty and routine. So um, I think part of it is just talking to them and not overpromising and saying, well, this is what I think is going to happen, but we can't promise, but we're in it together. And I think quite frankly, the fact that I wasn't traveling you know, multiple times a month like I typically do when I was sort of hunkered down next to them as we were all telecommuting, I think that did help. I think also this was really a moment of leadership. And I think they saw that in some small way, their family was contributing to helping people stay safe and stay healthy. And, um, and, and I think, you know, the, what I told them, we were also really lucky because we hunkered down back in, in Richfield, actually halfway between Akron and Cleveland, with, um, with a bunch of families. So we had this large pod, this big bubble, and we pretty much didn't go anywhere because we didn't know enough. We know a lot more now how this thing spreads and what precautions can actually work. So we just um, really worked together to say, let's take proactive precautions, let's learn as we go and, um, and do what we can that's in our control, knowing a lot isn't that in, in our control. And I would say, of course, we used a lot of Purell. Um, and, and one little thing I'll tell you um, we started doing was uh, using the Headspace app and sitting in circles as a family on the living room floor and just trying to take some deep breaths together. It didn't always work, but sometimes it helped a lot. That's great. So um, back to business. At Gojo, you were, you're the eye of the storm in a lot of ways. Um, the Purell, I think, is the most recognizable um, of all of the products out there and, um, and known for its high quality. So how did you, how, how did you manage that um, on the business side of things, um, on whether it's production or even um, helping staff deal with ambiguity and the kind of Purell community? Well, fortunately, we've been a purpose-driven organization since the beginning with really deep values that we needed from Goldie and Jerry, our co-founders, and my great aunt and uncle. And so we, we really grounded our response um, in serving the world, doing the best that we could to save lives and to make life better for people. So of course there were some heady moments, right? Where people felt really proud, but it really wasn't about, um, about growing the business, which was coming naturally with the process, but it was really about rising up. And our team, even right now, they are continuing to sprint this marathon, right? They are exhausted and energized at the same time. But they knew that they were really answering to this higher call in a lot of ways. Um, we had to do some hard prioritization of the markets. Like I said, the demand has been virtually infinite. And what business can respond to that? We're already making two times what we made in 2019. Uh, by May, we had consumed the entire annual amount of alcohol that we produced in products in 2019. Um, and so in the first five months of this year, and so every part of our business was challenged. We needed to procure all kinds of new raw material materials. We had to add our own productive capacity, which sometimes can take up to a year to do. We had to get contract manufacturers online and we had to, you know, actually in fact do partnerships and with, you know, odd, uh, unlikely partners, for instance, P and G, we have a, a bottle for, with Dawn, a Dawn shaped bottle that normally you get uh, for the kitchen, they allowed us to co-brand it and put Purell in it because we ran out of bottles. So I think um, I think we just really sort of doubled down on our purpose and everyone just got to work on the most pressing needs. Now, at the same time, remember, we're a bunch of people too, right? And we're generally a very face-to-face -face culture. We're, we're very communal as an organization and we thrive on dialogue in person and, and sort of duking things out um, and seeing each other eyeball to eyeball. So we rapidly had to adapt. And um, it's interesting, I've talked to people from other industries who have been thinking about their return to office. I talked to someone in commercial real estate and someone in oil and gas, 
And they both got back to their office pretty rapidly. And we acknowledged that you know, their industries rely on people getting back to work, right? Driving and consuming gas, um, going into commercial real estate facilities again. And so they were walking the talk for their industry. And on our hand, we are still all working remotely, aside from those in the laboratories and the warehouses and the production floor. We're working remotely because we really are a company built on prevention and, and staying healthy. So we've had to adapt our thousands of employees to working really differently. Um, it's, but the truth is, it was really just a trend that was already in motion. This is just accelerating it. So, um, so, so that's been fascinating. So can you talk a little bit about the um, communal involvement? Because I know that you and your family are so involved in community and community life. And obviously you have been very busy on the business end of things and on the family end of things. Um, so how, how have you made time for community? Where have you made time for community? Uh, well, I, I think you don't have to make time, you just have to do it, right? You know, people say, ask a busy person if you want something done. So we mm -hmm. just do, we don't think too hard about it. Don't doesn't really feel like a choice. I mean, I really feel like the concept in, in Judaism of mitzvah, of obligation, it, you know, it's not a choice. It's not a, an act of caring or or giving. It's a, it's an act of justice and, and it's compulsory mm -hmm. in, in our family's view. Um, you know, right now the needs are endless, obviously basic needs like we saw earlier with Mary Ellie's work, you know, and physical and mental health and basic social services on the one hand. And then, and then we also see discontinuity out in the world as an opportunity to reimagine Jewish life. So there's a great need for people who are in the Jewish life business to think, how do we make this into an opportunity? And it's hard to think that way when it feels so um, unstable. But I think it takes creativity and, and quite frankly, we also have worked really hard at staying true to who we are and not getting pulled in lots of different directions. So on the Gojo side, clearly we have corporate philanthropy um, that is you know, really important to continue to do. Uh, we started an employee emergency fund called the Goldie Fund um, in, in honor and memory of our co-founder Goldie Littman, who is a fantastic woman. And, um, and that's money that we seeded, but we also invited our community of colleagues to contribute to and get a tax deduction. So if any employee has any emergency, whether it's living through uh, you know, a, a hurricane or, or you know, having a personal situation where you've, you're evicted or, or something terrible happens, um, we have resources that they can have outright. Um, we've also doubled down on longtime partnerships. So the Akron Canton Food Bank, and the CDC and the WHO, we've done a lot of work with them, both for local, national, international needs. So we gave them additional funding. Um, of course, we are doing, um, you know, a, a lot around, of course, but we are, are starting to do a lot on inequity in the health system, right? especially given the awakening that this our country is going through um, post this summer. Uh, we are, I have to admit, going to have to develop a new corporate giving strategy because as we absorb the massive investments we're making this year, hopefully we'll be in a new situation um, if, if the markets um, stay strong for our products in future years. And so we have to think thoughtfully about, about what else we do. Um, in terms of the Jewish community, uh, you know, our family gives both as individuals as well as through Littman Can for Family Philanthropies. We have a couple family foundations. Um, we, we did mount a COVID response um, that had multiple parts. Um, one of them is really about our mission of applying Jewish wisdom. How do we take the Jewish wisdom tradition we're given to respond to basic human challenges and questions that we all have? So for instance, this organization, Trua, did a Jewish law and ethics hackathon where they wanted to apply Jewish wisdom to key ethical questions that are raised by the pandemic. And that just is exactly the kind of stuff that, that we want to support. Um, of course, you know, Jewish learning online um, is accelerating, so we wanted to support that. Um, we were already uh, working with an organization to figure out how does Jewish wisdom apply to mourning? And now more than ever, as people are grieving and dealing with loss in so many different ways, how can our Jewish wisdom tradition, even beyond our ritual practices, how can that work? Right. And they're isolated dealing with loss. It's one of the things that um, we've been trying to wrap our arms with as a community. How do we physically be there for people um, when we can't physically be there? And how do we make sure that 
if someone has lost someone or um, is sitting Shiva, um, whatever, wherever they are in the trajectory, that they know that they're, you know, that they're part of um, us and that we love them. And um, it's, how is it? Um, so let me ask you. I have to say one more thing really quickly. Oh, please, please, please. Uh, just on the eve of the election, I have to say we've also found it to be a Jewish imperative to support the institution of democracy. And so we've done a ton there really trying to support the Jewish community in a cross partisanship, because I feel like our community needs to come together, need to deep, deeply go into our Jewish wisdom tradition to find a future that unites us, doesn't divide us. And so we've applied our Jewish wisdom by doing a lot of work in, in the democracy sphere. So I just had to say that because I know we're going into- well, thank you. I, I appreciate you saying that. And, um, you know, we're really concerned about the political polarization and wanting to pull the Jewish community together because we're going to be here with each other on November 4th and January 4th and February 4th. And we want to, um, be supportive of each other um, in all times, you know, that we're in. So I wanted to ask you two different things in the time that we have left. Um, one, what does your crystal ball tell us about the next several months? Is there any insight that you can share with us? You're talking about the pandemic? Well, yes, the pandemic. Um, that's true. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping you weren't asking me to get into that. Okay. Um, so I will tell you, I don't think anyone's going to like this, but it's coming from a place of deep research and scanning and talking to the most thoughtful evidence-based professionals around the world. There is a convergence that's happening amongst the experts. While there are multiple scenarios, there's a convergence around one scenario that basically says that yes, there will be at least one vaccine uh, that has some efficacy in 2021. It will take the whole year to sort of roll out and to start seeing some progress, but it's not gonna be the silver bullet and there'll probably need to be multiple generations of it. And we don't know if this thing is become, going to become endemic where it's sort of like the flu where every year you have to get a different version where they have to use an algorithm to get the right mix of strains. So we don't know if it's going in that direction. But it's unlikely that, quite frankly, we are going to recover economically and as a society in terms of moving about freely until the end of 2023. Um, so um, what this means is that all the changes that we're making, we're going to have to both sustain and evolve as the curve comes down. It's not going to be quite as bad as it is right now. And we're going into another patch of wildfire. I prefer to call it a wildfire um, than waves. Um, but it, but yeah, there's there's a lot to um, hunker down around this scenario. No, it says to me that um, that frankly, figuring out how to care for people um, in the community and figuring out how to care for ourselves only becomes more important than um, the longer this goes on. So how do we community too. I mean, I know it's so hard, you know, not to come together to dance together to pray together to sing together to hold each other it's um it's a it's a really big challenge a really big challenge so let me ask you a personal question then how do you how do you juggle and navigate and what advice do you have for all of us as we juggle and navigate in our own lives um, through the next period of time uh, well, one thing in my little public health announcement is to not fatigue on the precautions right now. And you probably heard it, you know, they were talking about this um, in, in Germany on the news today, but it's true. Governor DeWine was saying it um, yesterday to some of, you know, our team members, but people are fatiguing and things institutionally where people are going back to work or going back to school, they're doing it safely. They figured out the basic protocols and there's not that much communal spread where it's happening actually is in personal, in, in personal spaces where people are fatiguing and saying, I just got to see my brothers and my mom. I'm going to have them over for dinner just this one time, or I'm going to have some friends over to play cards because it's just been so long. 
And quite frankly, a lot of the, the growth in, in, in the resurgence is coming from private gatherings. And I know we're about to head into this holiday season and it makes my colleagues and me very nervous that um, this fatigue is, is gonna set in. So I guess I would just ask all of you to try to be creative and how you can safely be together, be more Scandinavian, invest in good winter clothing and continue to gather outside. <laughs> Um, you know, inside is, is, unless you have a very serious air filtration system, even six feet or 10 feet apart inside, if the air is not turning over, is not safe. So I know I sound pretty serious about this, but I, I really want everyone to take it seriously. Um, and the other thing I would say is, you know, even putting, you know, that is, you know, putting that aside a little bit is, you know, have hope and, and be sort of balanced about it, right? You know, don't, don't freak out, try to make those, you know, take those you know, calculated risks, right? See a friend outside and send your kid to school and, um, you know, do the basic thing. So I think that's important. Um, and, and I think, you know, finding those small things that you can do, even if it's just like, you know, stretching your neck a little bit when you're sitting in front of a Zoom all day long or taking some deep breaths um, or enjoying. I know it's crazy for those of us who are trying to work and live all the time with our kids, but it's a special time and we're, the world's going to pick back up at some point and we're going to look back with a little bit of wistfulness that we didn't necessarily appreciate all the togetherness. So I would just say, you know, try to appreciate it. I try to pinch myself every so often and say, okay, this is what I wanted. I wanted four crazy kids while I was working. Oh, thank you. It's, um, I have to say, looking at the schools in our community, I am, I'm blown away. Um, all of them, um, Schechter, Mandel, uh, Mizrahi, Hebrew Academy, Yeshiva Derech Torah, the um, public schools that have opened and the privates, I seem to be doing just a phenomenal job keeping people healthy. And it's such a testament to the leadership of the schools and to the teachers and to the parents, um, because it really requires everybody working together. And I'll say that that's what I've seen um, in Jewish Cleveland. The last seven months, while they've been totally bizarre in so many different ways, there have been so many incredible, incredible things. Uh, you know, Mary, Mary Ellie's story is a perfect example of um, the type of story that we're seeing where people see a need and they reach out um, to help people and they just figure out how to do it. And across the community, um, people are doing thoughtful things for each other. We're trying to help in facilitating those, you know, caring calls to people who are isolated, um, like thoughtful thinking of you kinds of gifts um, to other people who are isolated. And that combines with the, um, you know, the additional assistance for food and for mental health, because we know that being isolated causes so many different challenges. And the ambiguity, as you said, causes so many different challenges and welfare and Jewish family services um, and the professionals that we have in the community have really been out there from moment one, have not um, have not missed the beats. It's really, it's a tough time and a tough time for so many. And it's a time where I look out at the work that's going on that our volunteers and donors and agencies are doing and, um, and our staff. And I'm so proud and grateful to be in Cleveland and to work with the, the folks that I, you know, that I'm lucky enough to work with. Um, it's really, it's really been tremendous. We've kind of put it out there that our vision is that um, while our buildings are closed, many of our buildings are closed, our communities are open and engaged and that we want to leave no one behind. And we look at, you know, it's as you talk about your kids, what do we want our kids to say to our grandchildren about today and how we respond to it? And we keep that out there as a post and keep trying to, you know, trying to move towards it. Well, you know, some of the deepest relationships are forged in fire, right? So I, I do believe that everyone who's going through this together will come out with lifetime friendships and partnerships. And um, it's hard, but it's also deeply rewarding. And you're also talking about 
just find your purpose, right? So everyone who's here tonight, we all have what we contribute, can contribute, and it's all special and different and unique. All of it is needed and wanted. I know that I want to do a million more things than I'm doing, but I also have to go to sleep at night saying, you know what, I'm doing what I can and, and, and I should just be okay with that. So hopefully everyone tonight can find their purpose and how, uh, how they fit into this vision that you just articulated, Erica. It's beautiful. And I know your leadership has just been um, life-changing for the community. So, um, so thank you for being so strong and so bold and, um, and such a great role model for all of us women. Thank you. I'll, I'll end by saying years ago, I remember sitting on my couch um, in an old couch in my house with Marcella thinking one day we're going to work together. This is not what I had in mind. It's a start. But it's a start. But thank you so much for your leadership, um, both at Gojo as well as um, in the Jewish world. We're also better because of it. And um, and it's just it's great to have you um, with us in Cleveland. I'm there a lot and it's, it's great. Thank you too. Lots of friends. Thank you to all my friends who joined tonight too and my family. Well, I also want to just extend thank yous, um, both of you. I think all of us on the call could just sit here and listen to you talk for hours. Um, you're just so smart and engaging and the, the passion comes from here. And it's so in, just beyond inspiring. And we're so, so grateful to have both of you as the captains of both of your ships leading the way through all of this. Uh, I know everyone is feeling incredibly inspired and I think Marcella made a, a perfect transition into what is our purpose and where do we all feel uh, we can contribute. If anyone's gonna create change in this world, it's the women in philanthropy on this call. Thank you for being you for all that you do and all that you will continue to do because Jewish women are leaders. From Miriam in Egypt to Golda Meir in Israel to the late great notorious RBG to all of you, Jewish women know when and how to stand up for what's right, how to support those in need, how to rise up, how to stand together and lead the change as mothers, daughters, sisters, nieces, and bubbies, this is what we do. All of you are women in philanthropy, strong, brilliant, amazing women doing so much good throughout this entire community. And together, we can do anything. Together, we are here for good. Keep a lookout for that email on Friday it's gonna let everyone know how many of the 300 plus came together and how much we pledged tonight. So text that pledge, visit the website, scan the QR code, make it happen. Our community is counting on all of you. Congratulations again to Marielle. Thank you so much to Marcella and Erica. Thank you to all of you. This is what it's all about. And there's so much more to come. Women in philanthropy, two little letters that mean so much. We're all in this together. Have an amazing night. Love you all.